Hey, Soraya. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? I'm all right. <laughs> Yay. Whee. How about a you? Little, a little, a little, uh, what do I say? Like kind of a uh, fried, my brain is fried, trying to get us tickets to see Paul McCartney, but we got them. So we'll, <laughs> we'll be seeing Paul McCartney this year. It is a very auspicious day because today's actual date is 2-22-22. Yes. So yeah. maybe we got a little luck on that end. Because the event takes place on Friday the 13th, you pointed out. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it should be a fun night no matter what. But yeah, um, I'm just happy. Concerts are happening. Yes. Yes. Whew. Should be good. Ooh, oh, but unfortunately, we're not talking to Paul McCartney today. But fortunately, we are oh. having a repeat guest. Yes. Mr. We Bradley Scott, having- right? Yeah, of the Bla- Bye Bye Blackbirds. Yes, we did talk to him when we uh, were talking about Boxer at Rest about two years ago. Yeah, like, the band has a, release. Yeah, yeah. The band has a new album that will come out the day that this gets posted. So, and I think that will be a band camp first Friday, March fourth. If you're listening to this, so good time to go out and get the new Bye Bye Blackbirds album. What was it called? It is called August lightning complex yes and jeff and i were really really fortunate to have uh, a listen and this is an album you want absolutely yeah yeah and we'll talk about try to get through all all 10 songs today oh child (laughs) including uh, a few guests Um, my shirt is a hint on one of them (laughs) sounds good let's jump into it I say so, let's do it. Hi, this is Soraya. And this is Jeff. Our podcast is called Paisley Stage Raspberry and Rhyme. A podcast where the two of us play music that we like and share anecdotes and background about the tune. We hope you'll join our conversation. And without further ado, agrubiar. Let's get groovy. 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 So Jeff, why don't you let our listeners know who's joining us today? Yes, today we have a very special return guest, Bradley Scott from Bye Bye Blackbirds. And um, I'm pretty happy that we didn't scare him away the first time, Soraya. Uh, I'm just as much. (laughs) I was a little bit leery. Uh, I think we roped him into doing it once, so I wasn't sure if we could get him back. And I was hoping to be able to mix up a drink and cheers of your new album But uh, the last 45 minutes have been on Ticketmaster acquiring Paul McCartney tickets. So (laughs) no drink. So all I got is water today. But seems like you would really need one after that, too. Exactly. (laughs) Welcome back, Bradley. We're really happy to have you today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, new album coming out soon, August, Lightning Complex. Um, So before we jump into it, where's the title come from? Uh, the title is, it's a it's a phrase that I think I sort of cobbled together, but the the bulk of it is from um, the the wildfires in 2020. They gave all of the major wildfires names, and complex was often what they were called. So you know it would be the area it was in or the time that it happened. Complex, and there was a one of the main fires up north was the August lightning fire. I don't know if they called it the August lightning complex or if I just put those words together sort of in my head, but those were phrases that were uh, around a lot during that that wildfire season. So it was just a phrase that got stuck in my head and eventually found its way, you know, onto a record. But um, so that's what it is, 2020 wildfire reference, essentially. Nice. And the, you decided not to opt to put it out in August and, and be cheeky. <laughs> Well, you know, you don't want to tempt fate. I mean, it was, (laughs) I think one August lightning fire was enough. (laughs) Agreed. So this is the band's sixth album, I believe. Yeah. Um, Last time we talked to you was two years ago for Boxer at Rest, which was definitely high on both mine and Soraya's year in list. The album was fantastic. Um, And I will say, um, Bradley, if it's okay to be honest, that this one was more of a grower for me and but it might be I might like it even more so so um at, at, 
the my first listen the songs are all good and then like five listens I'm like oh my gosh these are fantastic like they they just weaseled their way in and now there's a lot of these are like ear candy um we'll go through each one of those but mechanics oh my gosh thank Uh, you thank (laughs) you mechanics is see look at my list look at my list Uh, mechanics okay (laughs) number two on my list yeah there's probably there's probably like three or four that are battling their way inside my my brain but definitely uh an excellent album and a great follow-up to boxer at rest bradley thank you and and that's great to hear because it um it definitely didn't feel like as immediate a record as boxer and so i was kind of worried you know when we finished it up and getting it ready to send out into the world I was like, you know maybe will people be as immediate because people really seem to like boxer a lot and 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 they liked it right away which was great um so i was just a little worried that this one maybe wouldn't you know sink in but i'm, I'm glad that it's doing its its work yeah yeah I have a question for you because as I listened to it, I think the first, second, third time, I started wondering and thinking about what were the possible influences, musical influences that informed this record? Because I know what my brain thinks, but I definitely, I I, I don't think that's definitely the answer, but I'm super curious. It's always a hard thing for me to answer because in some ways they're just like the formative influences that have been around forever, you know, like for me, um, you know, the replacements and big star and velvet underground and television soft boys. I mean, there's these things that are the Smiths, you know, that are just Neil Young. I mean, I could just kind of list all the things that when I was first playing music are all for me still really present and there. Um, There's also, I find that there's not always a direct correlation between what I'm listening to and what comes Mm. out the other end in terms of writing or recording. Um, So sometimes I think about, well, what was I listening to at the time? I think, well, I don't really hear any of that. Um, But, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those names I I just listed are are sort of the things that are always present. Um, You know, there, and, and I, you know, I wrote it, at a time when there, I wasn't listening to a lot of rock music at all, really. Um, which so, you know, I can't even necessarily say, oh, these were the rock records that were being spun a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's a hard thing, you know, and it's funny because I, I hear a difference between this record and the previous record and it's part of its personnel, you know, we different engineer, different studio, all that kind of stuff. But I do wonder, you know, did different influences come to the surface somehow, you know, um, as opposed to the previous record, but I'm not sure. I definitely hear hints of Big Star that pop up for sure, at least to me, but it may be because I listen to a lot of Big Star. So, and, and there are those. I mean, that's always there. You know, that's a huge, that was a huge, huge deal for me when, um, and it was really when the, the reissues came out in whatever that was, 89, 90, 91, you know, there was the, the Ryko reissues and then the Arden two for reissues you know that for me was a real like you know kind of mind-blowing experience these things that I'd heard about and read about and then they were finally available um and so that's yeah there are things I go back to a lot there's sonically things that are kind of benchmarks for me you know like guitar tones and and certain ways of balancing instruments way certain instruments interact kind of an attitude towards making records you know big star a big deal for me um the an attention to detail but also a certain amount of spontaneity and and you know rough edge you know that kind of stuff is is all a factor so it's always there <laughs> I think but you're not there. deliberately sitting down listening to a song saying right. okay all right i've got xtc and i'm going to i'm going to take this yeah. song you're not doing anything like that no no and and Anytime I've ever tried to do that, it's been really disastrous. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. yeah, don't do that. <laughs> absorb uh, stuff that, that works its way through and, you know, and shows up. On a, on a side note, so allow me to take a moment here to pause. For our listeners, if you want a really, really good education and really just fun, please follow Bradley on social media because he has 
the ability to take a daily photo. I am not joking, a daily photo, which combines my three favorite things in the world. Beautiful cup of tea, <laughs> an amazing piece of music, and a kick-ass piece of literature. And he does it almost daily. And I think for me, as I'm watching, I go, man, we like, we like similar writers. Oh, I also drink. But it's the music. Some of the pairings to me are just super interesting. So I learn a lot about you and what, you know, what's in your musical DNA, or at least what's caught your attention. And so a lot of times I say, well, I have that. I have that. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, it's kind of like, it's just interesting, this little delve into the musical brain of Bradley Scott. I like it. I like it. Well, so thank you. Thank you. I mean, it, it's fun because, you know, I, I've worked at record stores and until recently I worked at a bookstore for years and years and years. And, and that's so much of working in those places is just like an ongoing conversation about where you're at. You know, like, what are you listening to? What are you reading? what ideas are in your head you know you're working with other musicians you're working with writers your your customers are musicians your customers are artists of various kinds um so it's sort of how i frame my you know navigation through the world really is just like these are the things that are that i'm in, engaged with and and so it's fun when you can put it out there in the world and people can respond to it and, and come back with their own version of it or whatever so that's great and so Ryan, what about those candid shots of people and natural locations in Oakland or you in, know in what? vicinity? Those just belong in a book. They belong in a coffee table book or on, you know, printed in on a wall in a, in a gallery. So, you know, and now we know he's super multifaceted and just an artist in every sense of the word. So, you know, I just appreciate being able to see. Sorry, you guys are breaking up. I can't really hear you. <laughs> Would you mind repeating that louder for the people in the back? <laughs> You're amazing. All right. God bless you. Thank you. All right. So back to the record. You were mentioning um, the, the difference in the engineering and the recording. So here we are two years post-COVID. So you were recording in the midst of this pandemic. How did that go? And, 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 and did that have any influence on who, where you chose to record this? It, it did a bit have a have some influence on that. Um, so there were a couple of funny things that as a result of, of doing this all during um, the pandemic, uh, one of which was that we rehearsed for a long time with no vocals. You know, we were wearing masks and and we were we were all being pretty diligent, keeping an eye on the numbers, is it safe? Our rehearsal space, actually, the, the people that own that place are incredible. They installed a whole new like filtration system and you know, slowly allowed people back into the building and they had all these kind of rules and stuff, It was, which was great. Um, and so the initial stage of, of making this record was rehearsing it fully instrumentally. And um, that ended up being really, really fun and really great and, and maybe even something we should do deliberately going forward, whether we need to or not. Um, and then, you know, those rehearsals were broken up you know, if the numbers got bad, then we'd take a break for a while and it seemed like things calmed down, we'd start back up again. Um, and then the the summer of last year, you know, was sort of that um, that sort of false hope era of where like, oh, things are, you know, we can really get back to some of the functional stuff. And so we, we booked time, um, you know, and we did it hopefully before every single band in the world booked time, you know. Yeah, right, everybody's ready to get back in. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but in terms of it influencing where we recorded, it did uh, in part because the, the studio we recorded at previously for Boxer, um, it's it's in a really rough part of San Francisco. It, it takes me a long time to get there. I don't necessarily want to be on public transportation for you know however many hours a day, all that kind of stuff. Um, but if there were creative reasons too, you know, the engineer is a guy that we've worked with before that I really love um, as a friend and as an engineer. Um, he's got a different style, a very different ear, and it just sort of felt more appropriate for the songs. And then it's a the studio is actually um, attached to the building that our rehearsal space is in. So it's oh. there was kind of a for me at least there was kind of a mental health aspect to it too, which is like this is like home turf, you know. I just like whatever anxieties about being out in the world, about 
going to different places, interacting with new spots. It was kind of like, this is a, it was a cozy spot, a place I knew how to get to. I could get home easily. People I knew, um, I've recorded there before. We recorded Take Out the Poison there. Um, I've done other projects there. So it just, part of it was just like making it as comfortable as possible to um, having not really worked in close proximity with other people for a long time especially in such an interior space, you know, like a studio and things like that. Wow. So you're, you're speaking of shark bite in Oakland. That's the, the name of the place. And, and Scott Evans was. Who Evans was engineer, yeah. Yeah. It sounds great. I think the record sounds great. And you posted um, some teaser videos showing some of the sessions, which got us all very excited and yeah. You know, I kept bugging you for a release date for a while, so <laughs> I'm glad we're coming up on it finally. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think like everyone else, you just wait for the vinyl to be loaded off the boat, and then you can finally start talking about actual dates. So. That's true. Yeah. So um, it seemed like you guys got in relatively quickly for vinyl these days, especially we got Record Store Day coming up, and uh, from I, I don't press records, but I hear a lot of, especially independent bands that are doing that, definitely are struggling with that. If, you know, if you're not Adele or, you know, and there's, you know, millions of pressings, you know, no disrespect, but I'm just saying that it's difficult at this point to, to get that done. You were able to do it relatively quick, it seemed like. It, it did. I mean, it felt interminable based on previous experiences. But when, like you said, when I was looking around and, and hearing other people's stories, it did seem like, I don't know if we just landed in the right window of time um the people we worked with you know just happened to be more you know less overwhelmed i'm not sure why that happened but i'm, I'm really grateful obviously because i mean we were prepared to wait for a really long time yeah you know, even longer than we did so um although i think you know in the in previous years th this album could have been out last fall in terms of like when it was done and ready to go and, and the usual turnaround time so Okay. Still a wait, but you're right. Not as bad as it could have been. Excellent. Can we dig into some of these songs? Please. Yeah. 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 So the album um, starts off with the starter. Um, what show as young is the the name of what show as young? On the burning streets of this town, with the old man. definitely stood out to me on the burning streets of this town because I think when we talked last time there was a theme about burning and some of the um there, I think there was a couple different buildings that were that meant a lot to the people um in the bay area and um it just it took me back lyrically to some of the the themes um with on Boxer at Rest um w was there any connection with that or Kind of. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it, but I think you're right to a certain extent. I think it may be in a more general sense um, that sort of the response to feelings of, of unrest, in this case, literally in the streets, you know, I think, um, you know, there was, there's a lot of, o Oakland is a real politically active city. There's a lot of protests. There's a lot of, um, uh, social advocacy street action that goes on here um, and and that song f for me like all the songs on this record and I'll probably say it multiple times I, I I wasn't thinking really hard about them they really arrived very very quickly both musically and lyrically wow and then later on you know I was just kind of looking at them and saying oh well, you know where does this come from what is this about and and this song um there's something kind of satirical, maybe even a little snarky about this song to me. Uh, it definitely has some sense of politi political ideologies, um, conflicting ones, perhaps, and, and a certain amount of kind of riled up energy around them. Um, 
but in a way that there's something sort of cartoonish about it, I guess, for me at least. It's, I don't feel like it's really a, a serious political analysis of things going on in the streets, but it definitely feels like that's kind of where it's coming from, at least. I mean, you have that great line in there, um, from the left ear to the right hook, <laughs> and then uh, towards the end of the song, on the burning streets of this town. I, I love that line. It's just a great, a great line. And who knows where that came from, I'm imagining. Just <laughs> yeah, I really don't know. Yeah, you know, it's a great like line. I said, a lot of these songs really arrived out of the blue. I was very surprised that there was a record. Like, I I did not think I was in a space where I was going to be writing one. I had, I mean, Boxer had just come out when a lot of these songs were written or starting to be written, and um, you know, so yeah, I think I just looked up one day and I was like, well, <laughs> here we go. You know, I had no idea that it was coming. I'm real curious um, before we get to the second song. So you, when you bring a, a song, these songs to the band, um, I imagine you, you're you there with your electric guitar and acoustic guitar and you play them for them. How do they, how does the band usually react? Um, well, usually I do demos at home. Okay. Um, sometimes with a kind of fake full band sound, if there's a real distinct feel that I, I want to kind of communicate and sometimes just acoustic. Um, you know, I mean, we don't, I don't get a lot of immediate response. I mean, sometimes I'll get like, yeah, I like that one. Let's do that next time. You know, like, mm -hmm. but I don't get a lot of, a lot of feedback in terms okay. of detail. Um, but usually by the time it comes to rehearsal, they know it to a certain extent. Like I don't usually teach them things cold in rehearsal. It's usually they've got a demo and they've learned it. Um, it can change a lot after that once they start adding their parts to it. But Usually it's sort of in a finished form where you can listen to it beginning to end and they have an idea of what all the parts and the shapes are. Okay. Do you ever feed off of their parts at all where there's like some energy that some of the band members bring that make you think, oh, let's let's take this in a slightly different place or? Oh, all the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, almost without fail. You know, there's, there's something that somebody does where I think, oh yeah, this is the new feel for this part. Oh. Um, or we need to do this twice as long, or we need to move this to, you know, like even rearranging the song structurally sometimes. Yeah, they, they, they're a huge part of it. And and in, on this record, probably more than even before, in part because we were working instrumentally, you know, there, we, we weren't, I wasn't focused on singing. We weren't using vocal cues. We were really just listening to us playing. Um, and that carried over into recording. Um, I think everyone or at least I tried to allow everyone more of a voice in the studio this time. Um, in the past, it's, it's we've always been sort of rushed and there's not a lot of time and you know running out of money. And, and so it's sort of like my ideas are just kind of getting executed, usually well, because they're, they're talented fellas. Um, but this time I really wanted everyone to have more of a say in, in what was going on. And so, it's always been a part of the rehearsal process and this time I think even more so and then carried over into recording. Ah, excellent. So Soraya, okay. let's go to the second song. Speaking of voice, in the literal sense, um, I'm a fan of Kelly on this next song, but thank you. So Soraya, what, what's next? So it's this amazing song, Mechanics. And Jeff, you know that I'm a total sucker, total sucker for beautiful harmony. And it's the melding of Kelly's voice and yours that it's hypnotic. It's, and it really makes this song go a lot further, at least for me. It, it's the song I keep coming to every time I re-listen. It's the one I want to start off with. And it's, there's something about this song. And I just want to add a little, I mean, this is my observation. This is just me listening, but there seems to be this real theme running through all these songs about raising, like raising a voice, raising the noise level and really kind of trying to grab attention because like for me, the first two songs, you know, you have this train roll, and the engine roars, like the, the volume just keeps going up a notch, up a notch, up a notch. I'm like, shoot, man, there's a message that needs to be here, heard here mechanics i love the i love the guitars especially on this song it's just whew. sparks 
keep the lights on and rattle up the wires. Stars blinking out, but you and I are. about the chorus this chorus is thank fantastic. you yeah Woo. yeah this is definitely in, in in my top for this song so um so at the end uh, i don't know if it's a, you call it a chorus or a refrain when you guys are repeating the baby it's all mechanics it sounds like are there three voices in there bradley there are casey's in there as well okay ah. yeah so it's me and kelly and, and casey doing our little round or whatever you want to call it little stack i love it Google thing. It's a yeah, fantastic Kelly's amazing. Yeah, I, Kelly's really, um, she steals the show so much, so often for me on this record. You know, Kelly's harmonies are incredible. She definitely has a couple of highlights. I think I may have seen her perform um, with some of the Camper Van Beethoven guys down mm -hmm. here in the desert in Joshua Tree area. I believe that she might have come down with them. She looks and sounds familiar. Yeah, it's very possible. She, I got to know her a you know, long, long time ago. Um, she had a band called 20 Minute Loop. It was really great. Um, and we've just, we've been in the same sort of circles for a long time. Uh, she's also, uh, she's also in a group called Kika, which is a, a vocal group that sings like um, Balkan and Eastern European folk music. Wow. And, you know, full garb and stuff. And they're, they're a big deal. You know, they sell out big halls and stuff around here. Um, so her range as a vocalist, not just, you know, vocal range, but just her, her the palette that she has to work with is extraordinary. And um, and she and, and KC, she and KC are in charge of, of harmonies. I have nothing to do with that. I might say here, you know, do something here. Here's a line that I want harmonized, but I really, I have nothing to do with it for the most part. And those two really go to town. Um, that's usually part of the ramp up to a record is usually a, a couple of sessions of just the three of us in a room and the two of them coming up with parts and arranging things and, and getting it all into place. And it's pretty amazing. All it's right. Song. Okay, Jeff, and next? I was gonna say, okay, so on the next one, so Joseph Becker plays all the drums on this album. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems to me, and I could be totally off here. So the next song is Out on the Waves. There's always one song on a Bye Bye Blackbirds album that has some crazy like syncopated drums and they're not that complicated on Out on the Waves, but there's this hi-hat thing that's going mm -hmm. on. It's very syncopated for me on, on the verses and it blows my mind listening to it. Like I try to, as a musician, I try to listen to it and break it down, but this one always blows my mind. Not that it's super complicated, but just the drums that he's doing. I would have a hard time as a guitar player playing along to the beat that that Joe brings to this, um, but it's fantastic. It's it makes this song so um, interesting to me because he could just you know do an easy three three fourths beat, but he's doing this weird syncopated thing primarily, and maybe I'm hearing it all wrong. But to me, it's uh, I, I'm just I'm a fan of this this beat, and I I think on one song on every album there's something like this that goes that happens i remember us talking about with boxer at rest that there are some weird syncopated drums on a particular track but Wait. 
you know how this beat came together? Or was yeah, this I mean, you know, it's it, if it makes you feel any better, we discovered recently that I count it in four and Lenny counts it in six. So, oh. so you know, it, it's there are definitely things going on in terms of, of the way the individual parts of the drums break down the beat. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously Joe's an incredible drummer. His, his track history is, is amazing in terms of the records he's been on and stuff. Um, but he worked particularly hard on this one. You know, I think there was a feel he was really after. And I, I remember going through a lot of different variations on the beat, him taking things out, putting things back in, moving things around a little bit. Um, so this one definitely you, is, it's one of my favorite Joe Becker drum parts on a record. And it was fun to watch it come together. And it's also a highlight of the record for me, just that drum part alone. There's a, there's a couple fills in it that are just really, really tasty for me. Um, but I think the thing that, that maybe makes it so unique is whatever he's doing with the hi-hat, the hi-hat is not keeping the meter in six, I guess, is according to Lenny. It's definitely, you know, playing off beats. Um, he's leaving holes in certain places that are really interesting. Um, it's it's a, extremely easy to play along with, which is strange. I oh. guess for me, it just feels very, it felt very natural right out of the gates, which is, a, I think, a testament to Joe's ability to hear and arrange, you know, something that just, that felt so core to the song right away. Um, but you're right, it is an odd drum beat and, and you're not the first person to point out like, oh, wow, what's he doing? What's he doing? What's, the, you know, and I love the way it was recorded too, it, it really captures his sound as a drummer well, and that's always really fun. So that's yeah, nice. Cool. And then again, um, as far as themes, there's a line towards the end of the song where you say, don't let the blazing heat peel back your heart. So again, you have burning heat. And um, I like that that you have this theme, but you're inter interplaying with, um, I think, emotions, right? Don't, don't let it peel back your heart. Um, I'm guessing this is probably just something that came with that much thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just do that. I don't know how or why, um, but you're right. I mean, you know, again, you know, I, it was fire season. <laughs> 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 something about that, I suppose. And we do live um, in California. So. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, for that reason, at least. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know where they come from, but there's, I think because this batch of songs, even more than the previous ones, arrived very unfiltered in a kind of unfiltered and very, you know, fast manner. Um, you know, there are themes that run through it that mm -hmm. are, you know, just things that are whatever just happen to be in my head or in the or in the world around me somehow. Um, so yeah, I think I did the same thing, you know, at some point sat down with the lyrics and went through them and, and just found, oh yeah, this is interesting. All these things are popping up, uh, but they were definitely not in my mind on a conscious level, you know, what I wanted to write about. That's pretty cool. All right, Samaya, what do we have up next? Something from the old world. I love that title. Oh my gosh. My favorite part of the song is right at the end, these lines. Feed them to the old world on our laurels. Give us the verse, something from the old world. Bleed out the old wounds and sing us the old familiar song. Pigs in children, blind in the lights. Feed them to the old world. On our laurels, give us the verse. But this is this. I should have you read the. I should have uh, you read the audio book. <laughs> it's really I was like, oh man, well, you know, that? that sounds great. That's my, that's my, that's my trick. That's my party trick. I just love the vibe of this song, and you know, as I'm listening to it, I'm like, 
this just sounds like a really vibey 70s rock song. And then along with it, I've got this really cool story that's guiding me through it. This is a, it's a, the leading up, the, all of these songs, and then including the next one, I feel it's like one unit. And then, and then, you know, there's like a switch, but I really like the song a lot too. It's funny that you, different. you brought up the vibey seventies thing that, that didn't come to my mind, but now that you say that, I'm thinking, I mean, you got hand claps in here. It's like, was, is this the raspberries? What's going on here? <laughs> so it, it sounds great. Yeah. Good catch, sir. I didn't catch that. This is, this is me. Don't pay attention. <laughs> this is so, me. so we're almost halfway through going through these songs. Bradley, do you have any particular favorites before we continue on? Like anything for you that you really like how they turned out or are more uh, meaningful than others? I mean, it's a little too soon. It's still a little fresh for me in terms of just, I'm still sort of almost in like the creative part of it, still thinking about <laughs> how to mix it, you know? <laughs> yeah, <I mean, laughs> you know like you're that. still on um, the technical side. But I like it. I mean, I, you know, there's usually some point in which I, you know, I put it on headphones and I, I go walk around the lake and listen to it all at once, you know, and that sort of is when I decide how I feel about it. So I do like it. Uh, I don't know if there are individual songs yet kind of there are a lot of parts there are a lot mm. of things that I just feel really good about um things that we did intentionally we we spent a lot more time trying to get tempos and grooves you know feeling better on this I think in the past we've always been a little bit rushed and we've taken a good band performance that could have been a little bit better had we taken it a little bit slower or faster or you know been a little more nitpicky about some aspect of the groove and and the that part of things I think we did that better this time mm. um so that's fun so the songs in general have a kind of a stronger feel to it to me I think Aaron and Joe sound stronger they sound more like what they sound like in the room you know when they're kind of at their best which is fun uh, uh Scott Hirsch is the the guy that mixed the record and uh I love that he the guitars are really loud <laughs> You know, I'd yeah. never worked with, with, with him before and, and I gave him a lot of leeway, you know, I didn't give him a whole lot of instruction on stuff. And, uh, so like something from the old world, you know, like I really love the just kind of the guitar interaction on that song. Um, it, it's kind of, that's the kind of stuff that Lenny and I do very naturally and, and, you know, really get into that kind of soft boys television thing where it's like there's two lead guitars and they're kind of, somebody's taking lead at any given time and they interact in certain ways and, and they're very loud and they're always kind of in motion you know nice. so those are the kind of things that are sticking out for me more like moments and, and ideas that really came together as opposed to individual songs got it got it because now i i have a big question we get the title track smack dab in the middle song where it's placed it seems to be kind of like a I wrote down in, in just in my notes I this is like a, it feels like a breather to prepare for what's coming next because then after it I'm getting I'm getting like a punch it's like I'm getting a completely different vibe was August Lightning Complex as a song again I, I appreciate what you've been saying that a lot of these songs came organically. Was this just another piece that came organically and, and felt like good to place where it was? Um, because this is where musicality really just, you just get to enjoy it. So the song is just an, a solo acoustic, yeah. performance, right? I'm guessing that's you, Bradley. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, um, so that's, that's how a lot of my songs start. I do a lot of like wandering around the apartment, noodling 
finger picking style on acoustic guitar. And every once in a while, extremely rarely, that's where a song just stops, you know, like that's it. Um, there was a song on Take Out the Poison called I Meant to Write, which was an acoustic instrumental for months and months and months and months. And then one day, melodies and lyrics suddenly kind of came to mind and that turned into a, a it's, it's also a ballad or acoustic ballad um but this one it just kind of stayed this way you know i was just playing it and playing it and playing it and then one day i was like oh no this is how it goes this is this is the song um and uh i mean part of it is just as a as a music listener as a fan i love that kind of thing on records i love something totally different, something, you know, that, that has such a, a kind of palate cleanser aspect to it. It's a totally different mood. Um, and then also, I think, you know, you talk about the sequencing of the record, which is something that we work really, really, really hard on. I mean, I'm very conscious of it. Even at the demo stage, I'm already thinking about how things kind of, you know, sit next to each other. And then the band also, you know, we, we have long conversations about it. Um, and something like that, that, you know, that's the kind of thing that I feel like I really learned from Scott Miller, you know, his sequencing of records, he would sequence records before songs were written, you know, he would have Whoa. track listing for, I think, I'm trying to remember what record it was, there was a track listing for a Loud Family record that I saw before he had written at least two or three of the songs that were listed, you know, like he had this feel of like, wow. how he wanted it to go. Um, and his his best records for me are the ones where you've got these you've got a certain amount of momentum and then something it changes he provides this transition into another part of the record um, and in in his case it was often I think much more thematically deliberate you know Inner Babe Concern is a is a real example of that for me where there's a number of reset moments on that record. And the songs after it thematically go to a different place. It's right. almost like he's built something up and he says, okay, wait a minute. No, 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 no. This is now where we're going. And I, I don't do that so much intellectually. I don't think the way he did in, in terms of how I write, but musically, I do think that way. And I think being such a huge fan of his and studying how he made records so closely and, and stuff, I think that's, that's kind of... A, uh, a hangover from that for me you know it's like I've got this acoustic instrumental great oh no this this is perfect you know this is how we're going to move from this feeling to this feeling how we're going to you know kind of make a sort of almost like a cinematic kind of transition on a record I see it yeah yeah and it feels that way because we move from August Lightning Complex into We Got Lost and whoo The word I want to use is in Spanish, but it's like a slap una cachetada. Cha! It's like, <laughs> wake up. Here you go. Here's something new. And then it's, you know, and then you just drive. This song just drives. It's guitars. And then even with the reprise, it's fuzz. It's, all, it's this meaty song. It's so good. And it really is that transition in tone and just vibe. Please forgive the doorbell. <laughs> so it's the only co only song with uh, co writing help, um, and of course Matt Piucci comes in here. How does how did this song come together? Um, so I had the I had the verse melody, and uh, as I mentioned before, it was just this thing I was walking around the house playing over and over and over and over again, and and I don't know necessarily why I thought of. Uh, of Pucci, I guess there's just something. It, you know, it's in it's in drop D. It's oh. got this kind of droney. We actually a lot of songs on this record are in drop D. At least three or four of them. Wow. Um, and so it kind of had this, you know, like psychedelic droney kind of feel to it. 
And I, I had this melody that I liked, but I didn't really, it wasn't really going anywhere after that. And I, I just sort of had this burst of inspiration. I just thought, oh, Pucci, Pucci's the guy that he'll know what to do with this. And um, I think we did it in like two hours. Like I, I, I think I texted him and I said, I've got this idea. I'm going to send you this melody. Let me know where you want to go with it. He came back with a few lyrics. He came back with most of the chorus. I think he predominantly wrote the chorus um, and maybe half of the lyrics. Sometimes they were just phrases, you know, like I want this phrase in there. Okay, I'll, I'll figure out how to you know, work it in. Uh, but it just, something about, you know, that part just felt like a Pucci kind of thing to me. And and luckily he was he was game for it and it came together. And, uh, and, and again, that sequencing, is very deliberate you know just that um the the acoustic song is also in d and uh so you got that kind of chimey thing at the end of it and then you've got the rhythm section that starts the next song and it just uh as you said it really just had this flow to it that i thought you know really emphasized sort of the power of, of we got lost when it kicks in yeah when i hear it i was listening to it on headphones i I was thinking when I was listening to it, the way that it was mixed, I think I hear Pucci on the left side. And, and sometimes there's multiple, multiple guitars going often. Um, was that Lenny playing with Matt or double Matt or you or the three of you? What's... So yeah, let me see if I can remember. There's three guitars. Uh, okay. the, the verses are me and Lenny and I'm doing all the like twiddly stuff, all the like kind of like the fake Richard Thompson Oh, notice that's all that's all my stuff. And oh, Lenny's okay. actually just playing like kind of like um, sort of a chunky little rhythm thing during the verses. Okay, the yeah. Choruses are Lenny and Pucci harmonized. I think I think Pucci's playing the high harmonies. I'm not sure what that is exactly. Okay. What? So the choruses are predominantly those two, um, and then the verses are predominantly me. Ah, okay. And, uh, the reprise is Lenny and and it, Lenny's pretty quiet on it, and then Pucci's the main soloist on the reprise. guitar at all in the reprise there's a there's two tracks of of drone mm -hmm. noise yeah. underneath that yeah. are all me Ooh. and um those are i just those are just like open tuning uh okay. sitting you know hitting the guitar playing with a whammy bar kind of stuff that's just underneath everything um but lenny and, and pucci did those solos i think i forget how many passes we did we just had them solo over a loop of that the bass and drums you know for five minutes or whatever and did it again did it again did it again and then we took all the favorite pucci parts and chanted them all together and wow and, and threw that wow. out uh, so it, it's definitely like a psychedelic freak out going on there so i had originally thought that maybe when you guys had recorded we got lost that you guys just kept going like something like camper van beethoven would do and then they would chop like the second half off and make, turn it into something but it sounds like you deliberately recorded the piece as its own individual piece? Yeah. Um, oh. It was funny because I I had the idea to do it that way and the idea that it would be on the record. It's two different tracks. I found this on the web. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, th that's a, there was a single version in which I, we put them back together just because it was kind of fun. But the uh, it was hard to, for me to explain to everyone exactly. I was like, no, 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 no. We're going to stop and then we're going to, you know, just play on this this riff basically the bass riff and and just make a bunch of noise on top of it um but yeah we just the the reprise is actually looped it's just a loop of lenny and aaron and we looped that for however many minutes we looped it for and then we just layered stuff on top of it and then we pieced together pucci solo the way we and lenny's parts the way we want, thought it sounded cool and then you know came up with a hard stop for it at 
a minute or whatever felt like long enough for people to sit through that kind of nonsense. Um, but yeah, so we didn't even play the reprise. The reprise is not a performed thing. It's a loop um, taken out of the, you know, the original song. And um, I, I was, there were a lot of different approaches to it. I think ultimately the one we came up with is the one that sounds most like just a band jamming, which is probably the way to go. Um, I thought about using some of Doug's keyboard parts from the song in the reprise too, but at some point, you know, there's just there's just so much crap going on. You, kind of <laughs> just, you know, not add more to it. All right, so so next, uh, there's a couple. Another lines. one of my favorites. Yes, favorite stars. Favorite stars. Yep. So, Track number seven. So there's a couple different lines in here. I don't know about you, Soraya, that really stuck out to me. Again, burning. So burn up on on reentry. You're you're talking about right off the bat. So I'm very curious about the imagery there, and especially this stanza where you say, "We're here to pin the metals, um, here to pin some holes so we can breathe." That image, that imagery is just fantastic for me. I have no idea what what you're referring to, but I imagine I have a lot of things going on in my head. I'm flung out in forever pouring all the blood onto the leaves. So there's a lot of imagery going on here, very literary. Um, and I know you like to read, you worked at a bookstore for a long time and as Soraya mentioned, um, you even knew you were pairing with your, <laughs> with your photographs, what appears to be. So there's a lot of imagery going on here and um, is just random imagery. or specific thoughts i mean it's it's imagery that all hangs together for me whether i know exactly where it's going or not um you know it's things that feel right things that belong together uh in the in the in the process of writing you know sometimes it, you know a phrase jumps out and like oh yeah this is how we're going to start and it just sort of leads to other ones um but they it, it, they definitely arrive in response to what I've already got. It's not, you know, like random line from here, random line from there. It's definitely feels like a, a in the writing process, it feels like it's building on itself. It's going somewhere and I just have to, you know, sort of follow it and shape it appropriately. Um, for this song, there's, there's some kind of, I don't know, is there like a space travel theme? I'm not entirely sure. There's definitely something about outer space, which is not, necessarily something I know a whole lot about or spent a lot of time um, pondering uh, but again you know I don't there must have been some sort of imagery that was really resonant to me and it, it started to build on itself and it, and um, and it, I guess it you know it, it reflects reading in the sense that that's what I love when I in reading like I language is is a huge deal to me I love a great writer. I love someone whose voice has a lot of character, has a lot of personality, is really interesting, the way they use words and phrases. And in, in general, as a reader, that's more important to me than narrative. It's more important to me than what the book's about or the characters and what the characters experience is. Actually, how it's written is the thing that I love the most about it, um, usually. Uh, and so I think I kind of write in a similar way. You know, I, I'm really responding to phrases and words that have a lot of, that just have a lot of feeling to them and, and make me pay attention mm -hmm. and, and make me respond to them. Um, and to me, the judging whether they're working or not within the song is, is how they feel together and how they feel, you know, in terms of momentum across the song. I love this. To me, it's the voices coming together in uh, towards the end of the song. Years hold on tighter to keep warm. Years, baby, can't you feel the storm? We're never coming home. It's that part of the song is really, I don't know. It, I I got really caught up in that, and I just love how the voices all came together. That 
was really yes jeff it's one of my favorites <laughs> i've listened to it often yeah, yeah. I, really, I have to give aaron a lot of credit on this one too because i when i first wrote it i i for some reason i didn't i wasn't sure whether it was really finished or whether it was really that great or not and um but i sort of had it and it was complete and so i sent it out to everyone and aaron was like this one we really got it you know we really got to this one needs to be on there. This is this is definitely a winner. And um, he kind of talked me around because I was really kind of nonchalant about it. I was like, oh, you know, maybe it's a little silly. I'm not sure. But uh, so I got to give Aaron credit for really being diligent and, and being a champion for this one because it, it did eventually turn into something that I liked quite a bit. But I, did, I didn't know where it was going at first. It's a great yeah. team. And I think that's that's really cool about how you were saying you wanted to make sure that everyone had a voice on this. It, it just sounds like this was a different approach and you know a lot of different things rose to the surface that perhaps didn't catch your attention at the beginning it's really interesting. yeah and, and i think it's mostly just because we had maybe a little more time in which to, to allow, allow that process to happen i mean i've i've always wanted and allowed for people to to be a big part of the process of arranging and 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 then into the the making of records um but Again, you know, you just always run out of time and money and, and you know, people's lives are busy and, yeah. and, and this time it was just very deliberate, you know, I think with, with Boxer, we had really short windows to do things and, um, you know, Doug produced that record and he had the windows between tours in which he could be here and physically, Lenny wasn't there for most of that record. So everything was very compact and we were making decisions really, really fast. And one of the things I came out of that record with was I really didn't we didn't have space for everyone to really be a little pickier, you know, express themselves more fully, um, do things a third time instead of just a second time or whatever. So that was a, it was a deliberate part of this process was a giving more space so that more of that kind of thing could happen. Cause it always, it, it's always better when that happens. You know, these guys are, these guys have made a lot of really good records. They've been in a lot of really good bands. They played with a lot of really great songwriters. And so it's my good fortune to, have them available to me, but also as band leader, partly my job to allow that wealth of experience and to come through and make everything better for everybody. Nice, nice. I love All right, that. Jeff, next track then. Yeah, so I, Soraya knows that I obsess over sequencing. So I'm very glad to know that I have a brother also uh, on this zoom meeting that thinks like me uh, <laughs> to me I, I think of I, I think of albums as a, a whole piece right and how they're placed together um so I have a question so marching is the penultimate track um second to the last track clocking in over nine minutes um on boxer at rest if it gets light I believe was the penultimate track and that was about a little under eight minutes too second to the last song again um a beast of a track. Um, this song is definitely uh, marching. Is m more of a down tempo song. You bring it down um, again before you you bring a little heat at the end. Um, so is it sounds like it's very intentional placing these um, these longer pieces in this next to last spot in the sequencing. Is is that the case? Is it very? It sounds very deliberate. I it is, I hadn't thought of it, but it, it definitely, it must be, you know? <laughs> uh. thought about the fact that the two longest kind of most intense in a way songs are in the same spot on those two records back to back i'm trying to think the the only other song really in the catalog so far that's similar is a song called spin your stars from um we need the rain and i think that might be last okay 
I can't remember now, but you know, towards the end again, probably yeah. <laughs> the look looking around to see if I have a copy of it. I don't. Um, yeah. And I don't know if that's just sort of like, you've come this far now you're really going to pay attention kind of thing or if, <laughs> or if there's something about you know I, and maybe maybe it's just something about like sort of the fun of, of of a more challenging involved kind of listen and then you've got something else you know like then there's the last song which is sort of a final statement kind of thing um and and i guess in some ways both with boxer and with this one you know it's it's more of an up-tempo sounding thing it, it's it's you know, something with a big chorus at the very, very end following it. I don't know, maybe just that, maybe that just plays nicely that way, I'm not sure. But it's definitely, a, you know, a very deliberate process. There's a lot of thinking that goes into where things land and how they flow into each other. And for me, the mastering stage is a lot of like how many seconds between songs, you know, oh. like I'm always going back to the mastering engineer and be like, can you do half a second longer between these two, <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, oh, wow. I, I think about that kind of, yeah, and I think KC has some sort of home mastering software and he was doing that. He was like putting seconds in between and we were testing it, you know, like, oh, how, you know, how does it feel waiting four seconds instead of three, wow. whatever. So, you know, yeah, these, these are important things. <laughs> these things are, these have to be worked out for a record to flow the way it's supposed to flow. I love that. I'll love add, yes, Spin Your Stars is the last track on We Need the Rain. All right. Clocking in at a little over six minutes. So it's... Each record, they're getting longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So there's a couple things I wanted to point out about marching. Um, uh, Bill Swan. Mm. So there's the horns come in. Can... Um, uh, did you have any input into what specifically, what kind of feel you wanted with horns? And I'm guessing that Bill put arranged that. He um, did, yeah. Bill's a genius. And so the best thing to do with Bill is to, to stay out of his way, you know, uh, to give him a kernel of an idea and then just let the magic happen. Um, the only thing I told him was that I just wanted sad trumpet. So that was it. That was his instruction. I was like, Bill, go out there and play something really sad. Uh, <laughs> and he did. Um, there are some yeah, long, drawn out notes. That, yeah. 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 It's kind of, there's almost like a, you know, kind of Chet Baker at the end of his life kind of thing going on with that. Um, but yeah, I've worked with Bill for 20 some years in various projects. Um, and he's on most of our records in one way or another. He's, he's extraordinary. Um, and and his you know his band Beulah is for a number of reasons I think a little bit sort of forgotten at the moment um, but I I predict that there will be a time when there's a real revival and people go back to the Beulah records and and kind of rediscover what an incredible band they were and what a great catalog that was so uh, yeah Bill's just one of those magic guys that. You know, if we can get him on the record, or and he he's played live with us sometimes, which is always a blast too. But um, yeah, he's pretty special. So yeah, I, I loved I loved being able to feature him a little bit because usually he's he's part of the horn section. You know, he's just the trumpet player in with everybody, and he has a lot to do with the arrangements. But um, it was cool to have a solo trumpet doing doing some sad trumpet stuff there for us. Sounds great, and the organ sound on marching is fantastic. I love that. It definitely creates a, a vibe. This whole of this this whole piece on this particular song, it's perfect sound for it. And then the yeah. last thing, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, yeah, KC played all the keyboards. Well, except for Doug's keyboard strings on "We Got Lost." KC plays all the keyboards on the record. Um, so there, there's a lot more than usual. There's piano on stuff, um, and we've never really used piano extensively before. Uh, and then on that song, KC's playing the electric piano with the a spooky vibe on it um yeah it, that song it's, there's just a million things happening on that song there's a lot of lot of layers and, and i give scott hirsch a lot of credit for sort of figuring out how to mix it and figuring out where things come in and where they come out um because we just gave him a huge huge pile of stuff and said it's nine minutes long you know go for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah thing. it's one chord progression for nine minutes you know have fun um and he did it and everybody's on it doug Gillard plays a little guitar on it. Lenny plays acoustic guitar on it, electric guitar on it. There's electric piano, there's trumpet. 
Um, a lot of that crazy stuff at the end is Kelly's voice run through processing things, Kelly's layering, doing all sorts of kind of Kate Bushy kind of things. So yeah, it's a, it's a fun one. I, I, I got a kick out of that one because um, it was sort of unexpected. I didn't know where it was going to go. You know, it kind of took on a life of its own and has a different personality than it had in writing, certainly. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so there's a long, um, a big majority of the song is you and Kelly with this, you're gone, you're going, mm -hmm. like at this long repetitive refrain, I guess you want to call it. Uh, so um, it's it's a lot longer than you would usually have in a song, you know, um, probably a, a good four or five minutes of you guys repeating this part. And it almost gets to be like a trance to me. Like it has a trance kind of feel to it. Maybe not in vibe, but just that kind of feeling, just so repetitive that it just puts you in a certain place. Is what is that was very deliberate, I, I imagine. Yeah, I mean that was that was kind of how it was written. That was the feel. Like I I had that chord progression, and I realized that I just I just loved playing the chord progression. Like I just loved playing it over and over. Obviously, I loved playing it over <laughs> and over. Um, and then when I was, you know, melodies and lyrics were sort of, you know, arriving to to join it, there weren't a lot, you know, there's only whatever, two verses, um, three or not many. And um, and I I did a demo of it and I I just kind of kept repeating that last phrase because uh, it was just kind of fun to sing and it sort of felt good. It had a feel to it. And um, I remember I sent it to my friend John Ashfield who's um he's in this great band called the bobbleheads who you, you uh -huh. might have heard um and he's always he's a guy that i like to to send demos to because he always has a you know kind of a great insight into it and he really responded to that re repeating refrain at the end he's like oh that's great you gotta do that the whole time you know and i was like oh okay yeah you're right i, I do <laughs> um, <laughs> and when we started putting it together with the full band uh Again, it was sort of this thing of me convincing them, like, no, we're just going to play this forever. Just, you know, once you get into this chord progression, that we're not going to change it. We're not going to, there's going to be parts here and there, but we're not breaking the song down or anything. It's just going to go forever. And I'm going to sing this thing. And at that point, it suddenly reminded me a lot of um, Low, oh. who have a lot of songs like that, they have a lot of really long songs where the refrain is, you know, the lyrics are minimal, the the melodic information is fairly minimal, but it's really powerful and they really drive it and they build a song around it and they break a song down. And I thought, well, you know, anything that sounds like low to me is, you know, that's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> you're, on, you're on the track to something pretty great if you're, you're recalling low in any fashion. Exactly, um, yeah. So I, I think low was a big part of taking it to where it went. You know, it's just like, wow, then, yeah, there's no reason not to play it for nine minutes. There's no reason not to sing this thing over and over if it's really doing its work and it feels good that way. So nice. All right, Soraya. So that takes us to the last track then. Another one of my picks. Yeah. <laughs> Mine too. No Mine too. Yeah. More horns. Oh. More horns. Yeah. Okay, but how about this lingering guitar at the very end? If we don't tell story. It's just uh, when I was writing my notes, I just it just feels dreamy at the yeah. end. So the the that whole extended ending is uh, is entirely Lenny and Doug Gillard, and Lenny's playing the like kind of fuzzy, rocky sounding guitar, and Doug is playing the like dreamy thing that almost sounds like a piano. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. I I have no idea what he's doing. Um, one of the things, I mean, everybody knows 
you know, that Doug Gillard is, is one of the great guitar players of rock and roll history. Um, but he's extremely imaginative in terms of um, how he arranges parts. Uh, that sounds to me like some crazy tuning, you know, and I've, I've seen and heard Doug do that before where he just takes a guitar and tunes down to whatever you know, is going on and then builds parts, you know, that way. So I don't, I have no idea how he came up with the part. Um, I have no idea how it's played. Um, I don't know anything about it, but it just arrived. You know, I was like, Doug, do something on this song. I was like, oh my God, this is beautiful. Um, and he and Lenny's parts play together, you know, really, really well in this kind of unexpected way. Um, so again, it was like one of those things like, well, why, you know, definitely this needs to go on for a long time. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. And it's, it's one of those, one of those magic Doug things, you know, Doug and Doug and Bill Swan um, are really similar musicians in my mind in terms of how they think about arranging songs and how they fit into songs. And they're always looking for that little piece of melodic information that elevates everything around it. Everything they do is, is catchy. Everything they do is a hook. It's beautiful. Um, it's infectious. It feeds off of what's around it. Um, you know, when you listen to Guided by Voices records, especially from the past, you know, four or five years, there's a lot going on on those records. It's very subtle. Little keyboard lines, those are all dug. Little guitar parts, those are all dug. Oh, wow. And they're all really hooky and beautiful and, and unique. And that's what he does. You know, that's how he thinks when he hears a song and just figures out, oh, this is what I add to it. Um, and Bill does the same thing. And so those are the, you know, there's a reason that we try to get those guys on everything. <laughs> it just come up with these things and that whole engine of the song i mean i think in rehearsal i think it was just me and lenny you know doing some horrible like leonard skinner noodling or something <laughs> uh, which i really didn't want you know we've done that before and it's fun to do but i really wanted it to be different wow and, and the stuff that lenny came up with was great uh but uh and i also i'll have to ask doug doug will remember and i won't i actually don't know if doug and lenny heard each other's parts Oh, I think they may have done them completely separately, and then we just crossed our fingers and it turned out. You know. <laughs> um, there's also a there's a there's an Easter egg at the very very end as it's fading out. Uh, when we were recording it, I kept singing this melody at the end, and I wasn't sure exactly you know where it was coming from. I thought, oh, we should use that, and then it turns out it's a, it's a my bloody Valentine riff. Oh. Uh, I think it's the, the ending riff from Only Tomorrow um, from the most recent My Bloody Valentine record. And so I told Lenny to play. I was like, Lenny, go <laughs> listen to this My Bloody Valentine. I don't know what key it's in, but figure out how to you know, make it work or whatever. So the very, very fade out of it, Lenny starts playing the My Bloody Valentine song. Nice, nice. So probably only folks that are listening to this podcast we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll get this easter egg so. Exactly. Exactly. so one last thing that i had um, we've gone through all the songs the album cover which features um a young woman blindfolded uh, and you got several colors here um who came up with that and what's the what's the thought about this album cover because it's certainly not uh no, no burning fields or nothing related no. to the title so no yeah no flames on this this time um yeah I, I, it's my idea the cover was taken by a friend of mine named mike mike tittle who's a great musician but also a really phenomenal photographer and he took the cover that we or the photo that we used for the cover of take out the poison and at the time that i chose that cover he gave me a link to like you know, all his photos and just, just said, oh, just go through anything you want to use, go ahead and use it. And I, I had flagged the photo from the current record of the, the woman with the blindfold um, as something like, oh, someday, you know, I want to use this image. It's a great image. It's a really cool photo. And it was just kind of always in my head, you know, like this was something that we could go back to. Um, and for whatever reason, yeah, this was the cover. So yeah, when, when I started thinking about album covers, and, whatever that photo I was reminded of it and dug it out and so that's where that came from the colors I don't know where that came from but that was just again an idea I had I, I just so John Conley is the guy that's, that does the design on our records and um, I think I think I took like a, a horrible like low-res version of Mike's photo 
and then I think I went to like Microsoft Paint. <laughs> and, like, had these horrible color bars, and I was like, oh, it's got to be pink, and it's got to be yellow, and it's got. And John, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe when no one's looking, he's like, what is this idiot talking about? But he's always very like, okay, yeah, I could do that. Um, so I have no idea where it came from, but at that I. I, I wanted to use the photo and I just had this image of these color bars that were going to go on top of it and that's somehow I, I, I like it quite a bit I, I, it, it definitely pops for sure thank you no I'm really happy with it too yeah it um it kind of reminds me of Neapolitan ice cream which is kind of oh. cool <laughs> when you lift off the top and you look down <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> um we did on the the LP cover I'm particularly happy with because we did the spot varnish lettering so each color bar has the album. When you hold to the light, you can see the album title Ooh. under there. So nice. that was, that's pretty fancy. Uh, very, very nice. All right, Soraya. So here we are. So hopefully this is release day, Bandcamp Friday. So Bradley, if anybody that's watching this wants to buy this album, and they definitely should, I'm guessing we should send them to Bandcamp. Yeah. Yeah, for, especially for physical stuff. I mean, that's the only, it's not distributed. So if you want it, I got to mail it to you. Uh, so yeah, Bandcamp is, is the way to go. Um, digitally, it'll be, you know, everywhere. You know, people can, instead of Neil Young, <laughs> to, to us. I, I, I suggest that all Neil Young fans go listen to our records instead, since they're there. <laughs> there you go. It works. <laughs> So I haven't been able to order my copy, so I'll be ordering my copy this week uh, uh, on payday. So um, would you, you mind signing? Bandcamp Friday. Should I wait till Bandcamp Friday or, or order it a week before? And can you sign my copy when you send it out? Hey I man, can if you're signing, sign. then I'm gonna do it the same time Jeff does, and you're gonna sign. I mean, if your paychecks are anything like mine, they're not gonna make it till Bandcamp Friday. So you may just, <laughs> you know, if the money's in the bank, you got to do it right then. Otherwise, you know, All right. you know what's gonna happen. So my my order will be coming in in a couple of days here. <laughs> so for anybody that's watching or listening, this album is fantastic. Um, for me, like I mentioned before, five about five six listens in, uh, I couldn't I couldn't stop playing it after that point. So um, I have put it on a, a little flash drive and I play it in my car all the time. That's it's our new road trip album. So my wife has been subject to it too, and she's singing some of the songs too. And, <laughs> she's not even a music fan so oh that's great oh wow no that's that's high praise for sure thank you and thank you so much for bradley for coming on and talking to us about this album and bearing with us with all of our questions about each song <laughs> we I really appreciate, appreciate it the fantastic thank album you. yeah thank you very much all right and so next next time you release album number seven we hope we can have you back on <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we may be pushing our luck but um <laughs> Jeff? August Lightning Complex. Jeff, he Great may album. have all the songs ready right now. Look at how how fluid it was between Box Art Rest to now. So, I, I will say half of it is written. Oh, again, I have no. I. It's really well. You know what it is. It's it's not having a job. That's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> not having to work is the best possible way to get a bunch of songs written. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a plus, but. I'm sure you're going to be getting back to work here soon. Hopefully doing okay. something that you love. Hopefully. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, something's got to, something will come along. We wish you the best of luck. And awesome. again, thanks so much for coming on and talking about this album. August Lightning Complex. Bye bye, Blackbirds. Go and get it now, people. Get it. Thank you. Don't wait Thank until they <laughs> either do it now, Bandcamp Friday, but get it. Get it. <laughs> as soon as payday arrives. There you go. All right, Bradley. Thanks so much. We really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Talk to you guys later. All right. Bye. Bye. All right, Soraya. That is one cool dude right there. I'm sorry. That the band is great. Yes. yes. Bradley's an amazing guy. Um, I'm really, I really enjoyed this talk through the album and hearing a little bit about hearing a little more about how everything came together. Um, it's a good sounding album and these are really solid songs. Absolutely. And, and now, you know, he's given me some stuff to go back and listen to 
um, or look for the next time I listen. But um, shoot, man, I just, the part that has me tripping out is that um, we got lost. The reprise is uh, Lenny and Matt Pucci playing over a loop. Yeah. Uh, If he hadn't said it, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have put that together. No, it's a great piece of music too. Yeah. I love that part. It is. You know, I think this is one of the things that I appreciate about the Bye Bye Blackbirds and and more so about Bradley's songwriting. He writes these really compelling songs and then boom, this arrangement, the arrangement for the songs really, really are... um, they really speak loudly. And so, you know, these songs just, they're they're really good. They stand alone really well. And, uh, you know, it just seems that there's a really good synergy with the band. And then I cannot say more praise than I already have for Kelly Atkins. Yes. Kelly Atkins's voice. She's got a great voice. Really. And to know also that uh, KC is, like, for example, on... uh, that he was that third voice in that beautiful harmony. Yes. Um, on mechanics. That's a great part of that song. Yeah. Ooh. I yeah. mean, I gotta give Casey Bauman my my respect and tip my hat because that's a fantastic song and uh, you know, good voices, good song, good lyrics. I mean, I don't think you can get better than that. No, there's a lot of great imagery on this album because uh, Bradley is definitely an intelligent guy, obviously. And speaking with him so and very uh well read so you a lot of that imagery i imagine from um from the literature that he's read is, comes across i think in his level as a, a lyricist and oh yeah like, like you mentioned yeah there's some great imagery in here so yeah really highly good. recommend this album yes we give it i don't know you know siskel and ebert had like two thumbs up or i don't know do we have like we gotta come up know, we recommend you know two yeah. gold records or whatever but yeah. we enjoyed it we hope you do too yep. um, F- five paisleys out of five <laughs> five paisleys out of five there you go A great album and i think we both endorse it and think you should have it so absolutely, absolutely. enjoy your listening to it yep and coming up next, I think we'll be talking to the three members of Narrow Adventure next week. So that should be coming up with their new record. Um, if you don't have that, go look for that one. Another great album. And I think we'll be talking to the Callan sisters and Kel from Narrow Adventure. That band eventually became Wednesday Week. Um, I think most of our listeners are familiar with Betsy's House. A lot of these songs, uh, Oh yeah, you, you'll hear how they came together. So um, that should be a good one, too. Jeff, good music. Yes, I love it. Keeps me going. All right, mi gente. Agroviar. Groove on, Paisley people. Mm-hmm.